good evening, good afternoon, and good morning. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, well, depending on the, the location of the, those who join us in this virtual session today, a session that in reality uh, was long awaited and uh, with a quite intense program. Uh, this is nothing less surprising, um, considering that the booklet we are about to launch officially results from a, uh, a concern, a central concern of age members with replications at all levels of archaeological archeolo activity, from the production of scientific knowledge to its reception by different audiences. Um, if uh, there were any doubts about the relevance of this project, the numbers speak uh, for themselves from the financial support obtained for printing the booklet to the downloads made so far of it. Um, we have therefore here and now the opportunity to share this achievement achievement of the editors, uh, the authors, sponsors, age, and above all, if I may say so, of the readers, whether they are archaeologists, teachers, students, museologists, heritage managers, professors, historians of archaeology, or simple anonymous individuals to whom this booklet informs, alerts, inspires, and urges to review dogmas, prejudices, stereotypes, and myths. The idea of this book launch was to get together all the persons who were in creating this booklet in it, uh, collaborating and um, with uh, uh, celebrating with them, and of course, with the public, uh, its publication, and here, how their experience uh, with working and all supporting the booklet was. So um, we are absolutely ready to begin with this session and we uh, begin uh, precisely with the words uh, of um, with the words of the, the three editors, the responsible uh, for this booklet, uh, our very well-known age members, archaeologists, uh, Uros Matic, Laura Koltefan, and Biserka Gaidarska. So if you please, the three of you, uh, the floor is yours, even if virtual. Thank you very much, Anna Cristina. Um, welcome everyone. I'm going to start with our input uh, presentation about the booklet Gender Stereotypes in Archaeology. And since we have a very tight schedule, my job is to give you a very short introduction about how we actually came to this idea. So this is our booklet, Gender Stereotypes in Archaeology. And as you uh, also probably saw already, um, the cover probably looks uh, very witty to everyone, but actually uh, this is some very serious business. So can I please have the second slide? So if you look at this short overview of the literature uh, in gender archaeology, you can see that uh, a lot of work has been done for several decades since the 70s and the 80s, both in Europe and states, but also outside of these academic uh, uh, areas. And uh, the problem is that since I joined uh, European Association of Archaeologists and Archaeology and Gender in Europe uh, community, uh, of this association, I've noticed that uh, a lot of academic discussion in gender archaeology is going on. However, the general impact on the discipline is not big, and there is a lot of stereotypes still present in both the discipline and outside of it. So we find these uh, stereotypes both in academic writing, in museum exhibitions, sometimes also in projects, and in popular culture. So please, the next slide. Yeah, so as I said, these gender stereotypes continue to live and even flourish, both in academic and non-academic uh, settings. What do we do about this? And this is how we came to the idea to uh, answer with a booklet. Next slide, please. 
we have to do something different and we have to do, do something which is uh, attractive to a broader audience, uh, something which is uh, presented both in image and text so that everyone can understand it and not only those who are, are uh, educated in archaeology or, or who are focusing on gender archaeology or who have background in gender studies. Next slide, please. And of course, uh, we were thinking about various ideas how to tackle this problem. And uh, in 2020, at one of the archaeology and gender in Europe community meetings, we together came to an idea of producing a provocative, short, straightforward, and illustrated booklet, which is supposed to deconstruct various gender stereotypes. Next slide, please. I'm sick of connecting stuff. And we uh, discussed this idea with other age members. So we contacted uh, 17 authors who agreed to work with us on these projects. And we deconstructed some 24 stereotypes. Details about these stereotypes are going to be presented a little bit later. Next slide, please. So each stereotype uh, was suggested by one of the authors or from the editors in this booklet, and it is deconstructed both in image and in words. So um, we, uh, we thought about this as a, com um, a complementary thing. So uh, short 250 word uh, texts are uh, following this provocative images as you can see here on the slide. Next slide, please. And here are some examples. So on the left, uh, you can see one of the images which uh, is very often found in archaeological reconstructions and dioramas, that certain activities are associated to women and other to men. And uh, it is actually quite hard sometimes to pinpoint in archaeology whether or not uh, this gender, this strict gender division is actually based on the reality of the archaeological record. And something similar you can uh, see on, on the image on the right. So we are uh, having two uh, types of illustrations. One is a stereotypical portrayal of gender one can find in archaeological writings on different societies. And these are repeatedly reproduced as reality in pictures and in different contexts. So whether or not these are museum exhibitions or academic writing. But also we have these other types of illustrations. So we're asking the question, was this situation valid for every society everywhere in the world through time, or is this uh, culturally relative? Next slide, please. But we also have uh, following types of illustrations. Uh, the one on the left is something we titled, what is wrong with this image? So we are asking the community to engage with the image in the text and to think about how changes can be made. And this is uh, also leading to a type of illustration you can see here on the right, which is aspirational. So how can we imagine a more inclusive archaeology and gender archaeology in general? Next slide. So we were thinking a lot about diversity, how we can recognize it in the archaeological record, and also how we can start um, thinking uh, in archaeology through diversity of the past and the present. Next slide, please. And this is how the idea was born to, um, yeah, finance this project also in a way which is going to include other um, not so common and diverse uh, ways of uh, funding. And I give my word to Laura Kolsofian, my colleague. Thank you. Mm, thank you, Urosh. So um, I will be talking a bit uh, about how this book was made a uh, reality from concept to an actual physical and digital product. 
So uh, we teamed up with uh, Sidestone Press for publishing the booklet because of the impressive quality of their publications and because of the attention that they paid to design and illustrations. And we knew that they would be able to create a unique, fresh and modern design for the booklet, which indeed happened. And they were very excited about the idea of the book and supported us throughout the entire project. And we realized that the easiest and fastest way to raise the necessary funds for creating the illustrations, for printing the booklet and uh, publishing it open access was through crowdfunding. And this was also a good solution to reach out to people outside archaeology and raise awareness um, among them. So we embarked on a one month all or nothing crowdfunding campaign on the Kickstarter platform. And we pledged for 5,300 euros, which we unexpectedly raised in just six days. And the campaign was so successful that by its end, we managed to raise more than 7,000 euros with the support of 156 backers. And this means that our project was not only 100%, but 134% um, funded. And it was really an amazing um, result. And given that this was a crowdfunding campaign, we also had to give something back to our uh, donors. So this has forced us to step outside our archaeology box, um, get creative and design products for rewards, which we never did before. So inspired by Nicolas' illustrations and impacting quotes from the entries written by the authors, we created stickers, postcards, and fabric bags for our backers, which together with the booklet, we combined in four different reward packages. And uh, we then shipped these packages to our backers um, this autumn, and we hope that most of uh, them have received them. And um, crowdfunding campaigns are kick on Kickstarter are uh, all or nothing, which means that if you don't raise the entire amount of money, that you pledge for until the end of the campaign, you lose everything. So this has made us realize that we really have to put all our efforts into disseminating um, the campaign. And this has again forced us to step outside the box and think about effective ways of um, uh, disseminate, um, effective dissemination ways and channels. So we decided to launch the campaign in the Christmas season exactly one year ago. Uh, when we knew that people are more open to supporting, um, to support different causes. We created a visually impacting uh, poster for the campaign, which you can see on the slide. And together with this poster, we sent out dozens of emails and messages and shared dozens of posts about the campaign on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, we sent out messages to the Archaeology and Gender in Europe community and to the European Association of Archaeologists, which became our biggest sponsor. And Sistone Press also disseminated the campaign among its partners. And in this dissemination process, we also contacted influencers from the field of archaeology, such as Natasha Bilson from Behind the Trowel, who invited us to a live interview on her YouTube channel. And we were also in touch with archaeology-related projects and collectives with large online communities, such as Pajeta Truel, Behind the Trowel, and the Archaeology Channel. And all of them further disseminated the campaign and became our partners. And the strong dissemination made a huge impact, which increased the number of our backers. And on the 6th of September this year, the booklet was made available online on the website of Sistone Press. And we deliberately chose this day because it coincided with the beginning of the largest yearly archaeological event in Europe, which is the annual meeting of the European Association of Archaeologists. And we announced the booklet's online publication at this event. And that on that very first day, it had more than 1,000 downloads. It was inc um, an incredible number, which kept increasing since then until reaching more than 4,800 downloads. And we are still amazed by these numbers and um, thankful to everyone who downloaded the booklet. And in mid-September, the booklet was also published in print. And my colleague Biserka will now uh, share how the booklet has uh, got its own life after publication. My 
Thank you, Lauren. Yes, and, and this is the, the developments that we know of uh, on what people have shared with us. If there are things that we don't know about, please, and you know about, please let us know. Uh, so, uh, obviously, we had a presentation at the year itself, which uh, you can see here on the screen, but we also had another, uh, shortly after that, we had uh, another presentation on the Euro European Heritage uh, Days as well. Uh, and we had uh, uh, Urush participated in a radio interview in um, in Germany, while me and uh, Laura had a very interesting talk with Peter. I'm not going to tell you anything about it because Peter is one of our backers and he is working for Microsoft and he himself will tell you, but we had extremely interesting conversation with him as well. Uh, and uh, we also had a um, uh, the, 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 the Department of Archaeogenetics in the Max Planck Institute for Ev Evolutionary Anthropology has contacted us richly, literally out of the blue and said, we have this ethics group and we have seminars and we are going to discuss your booklets. Would you like to come? And of course, who, who refuses that kind of invitation? So it was myself and three of our authors that could quickly uh, 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 um, participate into, uh, into that um, seminar. And it was extremely interesting for us because uh, what we re realized that there are very deeply entrenched disciplinary practices and we, that, that became really, really very obvious. And we really realized that we need dialogues between disciplines if we are ever to break uh, from future stereotyping. Um, and that was really very instructive for all of us. Uh, next, please. Nothing is happening. Oh, yes, thank you. I'll start with the hamper because it's, isn't that lovely because we are uh, close to Christmas and uh, whoever may had that idea, uh, they're really, uh, 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 I, I, I was lost for words when I saw this uh, Christmas hamper. So you, as we say, our baby has a life of its own. So if that's how people see it and how what, that's what they think they need to do, so be it. But on the most serious part, uh, one of the um, uh, most prestigious uh, journals in archeology span is Antiquity. And in its December issue, uh, the editorial uh, was fronted, the picture was fronted by uh, a, 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 an illustration from our booklet, which uh, we, we really find, it, we're very proud of that because we are really reaching to uh, a very wide audience, audience because this is one of the most widely read uh, journals in archaeology. So we're really, really <clears throat> very happy that uh, we reached kind of uh, more uh, uh, official channels, if you wish, uh, for something which maybe at the outside doesn't look very academic, but yet it found its way to a very academic uh, uh, journals like, like Antiquity. Uh, we also know from, uh, uh, from, from what we were told that uh, the booklet, uh, not necessarily in its, in its printed form, but the um, link, the downloadable link has been distributed around departments with the idea that needs to be a teaching material that will be used in teaching. As several people have come back to us with that, which we find as a very uh, as a very positive development. Um, <clears throat> we also uh, uh, think that uh, it's, uh, it's not only in, 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 not in, it's not only in English speaking departments, but we also heard from one of our authors that the booklet has reached Latin America. And around that, we have been asked, do we really want to translate the booklet into different languages? Because obviously, we, we, we would like to venture with different languages, not just the English, uh, and to kind of expand our audience with different, with different uh, languages. And of course, uh, we know that people have been approached personally to say for their personal entries, how people like their, what they're saying, and they're taking their own entries to develop on different platforms, which again, is a, it's a, we're venturing in, in a different, in a different, uh, in a completely different world. Uh, the next, please. And of course, uh, one of the, uh, uh, the the most reaction, of course, come from uh, social media. Probably uh, some of you, most of you, all of you, uh, on uh, any some of these platforms, you've seen a lot of these. And I have to say that most of them have been really, really positive. 
and and uh, I had only one not so positive um, um, comments on a, on a Facebook um, feed in, in a major British Facebook group, but it was very quickly quashed by the people around and say uh, that there was a lot of support in which that one person kind of really um, didn't didn't get the support they they wanted to get. Uh, and also we were uh, uh, approached by um, somebody who, who called themselves Museum Space Invaders, and this is a feminist um, group in, in museums and heritage, and they wanted to ask us, and we are probably will continue to do that, how to ask to, to explain the whole process, how, because they want to replicate that and, oh, to do something similar, maybe replicate is a, is a strong word, and from the idea, from the conception of the idea to the final product, through the funding to the final product of the, of, of the printed copy, and we'll be in touch probably to share our know-how. So this is again, another way of uh, disseminating our product. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Uros, Laura and Spiserka. We are already a bit late, but nevertheless, we are moving on to the video sent by the illustrator Nikola Radoslav Jovic, who is on a research trip in Armenia. So Rose, could you please? Yes, you are already sharing it. So thank you. Thank you, Rose. I'm not listening. Are you listening? Yeah, I can't um, hear it either. There, sometimes there are problems when it comes to this kind of thing. Yeah, yeah I cannot hear it either. And it worked when we touched I'm it. not hearing Can you. Can you hear it now? No. No. Oh. Okay. No. No. And now? No. Hello, everybody. Oh, yeah. My name is uh, Nikola Radosavljevic, and I'm the person who illustrated the booklet that we are discussing about today. First of all, I'm really sorry that I can't be with you at this moment to be present uh, at discussion, but uh, I hope that you will mind since um, I'm right now at my you know, own research uh, on the field. <laughs> Let's say it that way. Uh, thank you, for, of course, for the, everyone who supported this project and who were involved in any way. Um, we really, all of us, really appreciate your full support. And, of course, your interest in this kind of booklets and topics since uh, all of us actually agreed um, how important and uh, how much do we all need things like this. Um, well, um, when we are talking about the booklet and the process of creating and making it, I will have to mention the first uh, starting point when Uros Matic contacted me. Uh, he told me that uh, he and his colleagues are going to create a book, uh, some like short book with short stories about uh, certain gender stereotypes uh, during the history and something that archaeology can support or uh, can actually like throw away with full evidences. Uh, to me, as an artist, it wasn't that kind of impressive and interesting because at that first moment, I was thinking about that I'm going to work as like, you know, like boring illustrations that we already saw everywhere and that we learn them like really good. And uh, what I asked Urosh was, well, how, how much of artistic freedom can I have during this process? And he was like, well, we will see how much, but let me show you, let me make you sure that uh, people with who I'm going to work are like fully open-minded. And he actually sent me like few of the first stories in which I really saw like a really good potential for illustrating. Because when we're talking about illustrating things like this, it's always the question of the artistic freedom. Uh, when you have uh, that, uh, that, uh, uh, um, that uh, number of uh, historical facts, 
localities, the scenographies and costumography in details, you can't be like fully living in a full fantasy world. You have to work with facts that uh, the writers gave to you. But uh, when I read the stories, the first few ones, I thought, well, there is a certain underline under the cover of the main text that can be fully supported with the picture. Then we actually started talking about the pictures more than about illustrations. So actually, I treated them the whole process during, during the whole process as drawings, not illustration, which was really important because um, I stepped away from classical illustration and classical process of illustrating the text. Uh, you see, when you work with illustrator, you give him or her, you give them um, certain information, you give them text, and you expect for the image to represent the text. Well, this was completely different and maybe an opposite situation, because in this case, during the working of this booklet, we all knew that image should not represent text, it should support it. Uh, we use the picture, actually, the drawings as the part of the text, like in the integral part of the story, to which we try to show what the stereotypes are in these cases. Um, somehow, in uh, some of the, of the moments <laughs> during the process, of course, there were lots of variations um, in between all of us because we worked as a collective, as a group. Uh, there were like points in which I was completely amazed by the unknown information to the history that archaeology can support. And I was completely amazed with ancient cultures, of course, because to me, it was a completely new field. Uh, so far, I was working in fine art disciplines, and I've been working in contemporary art for a long time. But uh, since I knew Ulrich as a friend, he was like, well, you could be creative enough to work with us. Uh, to me, working with this collective was some, some completely new experience. And to me, I learned a lot working with them, not only about the archaeology and history, <laughs> in fact, uh, in history, uh, but I also learned that uh, some of the sciences, some part of the science, says should be and could be supported on this way. Uh, also, what was uh, really interesting was uh, the experience of me as an artist on the project. Uh, this was not my first illustrated book on which I worked, but it was, it, and it is <laughs> still, uh, the first book in which, to which I realized that I am the part of the team who are creating it. Not only because the illustrations uh, uh, took the most of the place inside of the booklet, it was because uh, I was included in the whole process as a person who actually creates story with writers. Uh, the writers who are one amazing bunch of people really did amazing work. And to me, the knowledge about many things was improved, but I know that through my way, through my work, their knowledge was improved too. Uh, also, uh, what uh, what did and what made this journey much easier was that I was working with creative people. Um, I think that somehow some strange universe forces really brought us all together. Because you see, uh, when you work with one writer, you can rely only on expectation of one writer. But when you work with a group of writers, then you need to rely on editor's expectation. In this case we had like three editors and uh, all of them of course they they had their own uh, their own desires and wishes but uh, because these people were really 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 understanding uh, to me they actually gave me like full artistic freedom uh, during the process we had like some ups and downs in the moments in which i could not just get it that there were no like chickens in prehistory and to me it was completely new and amazing thing that like there were no chicken in prehistory history and um, okay it was really funny because uh, for the first one of the first illustrations of course uh, in which we are talking about the prehistoric family um, I was I was thinking about you know like a village and a house and a man and a woman and a wife and like there were like kids and the dogs and the chickens on the roof and then I was slightly suggested to change the chicken to the sky um, so to me and to me, it was like a certain journey. And through this journey, I think that we, with, of course, uh, uh, completely creative forces and working as a team, not as an individuals, 
uh, did done something that could be and is important to the community. Uh, the reason why I at first uh, stepped into all of this process was because I wanted to work with the community more. Uh, talking about the stereotypes, especially about the gender stereotypes, um, actually uh, does involve me a lot in, in that uh, storytelling and narratives. And uh, um, even me as an, as an independent artist, um, I'm trying to, to fight them and to oppress them, of course. Uh, and to fight back the system. So this booklet uh, was not fighting the, fighting the system and uh, this booklet does not call revolution. It just informs people actually what time we are in now and uh, what is happening around us. And that the situations in which we might fail really suddenly uh, are not sudden at all. Uh, I think that this booklet actually shows how history is uh, completely uh, not two dimensional, and how actually during the the, the archaeology, uh, the, how the archaeology's facts can prove that uh, the issues we are fighting even right now uh, are something that we took from our ancestors, not wanting to resolve them. I think that in this case, the booklet is trying to resolve something and to point out the things that we have to change. That's the reason why I really worked hard with these great people and why we created this as a finishing product of our work. Um, I'm really grateful for this opportunity and couldn't be grateful more to like work with them all again. Um, I'm somehow really um, temptated about uh, working again. So I hope that we will manage to continue working like this. Uh, since it was like a really teamwork, even if I'm not a writer, I'm not a scientist, I did feel like a part of the group uh, in which I can work with full-time freedom. So thank you once again, of course, for your support and for your presence today. And thank you for listening to this short TED talk. <laughs> See you soon, I hope. Bye-bye. Oh, thank you. And uh, we uh, now, I uh, have um, now the, the pleasure to give uh, the floor to Esther Banfi, President of the European Association of Archaeologists, if you please. Well, thank you for the possibility. And uh, let me allow to start with a commonplace, which however I feel uh, fits especially to our book launch today or tonight. And it sounds knowledge is power. This also involves the opposite direction. No information, lack of knowledge is the seed of bad of biases, uh, the den of, of cynical opinions and even sometimes discrimination. Everyone, so not having information and knowledge might be easily exploited, misled or used for dirty purposes. If people in countries where governments claim that the gender ideology is invented by the dark forces, were better informed about the existence and nature of gender roles in society. In that case, the cynical monitoring against sociologists, historians, archeologists, LGBTQIA community members, or teachers at school, and even kindergartens uh, were not possible to happen at all. If anyone manages to get rid of their stereotypes, biases, the new avenues open up for friendly discussions, for learning from each other, for expressing solidarity instead of turning our backs, boycotting places and events. Approaching, involving, informing people is the real support. This is the expression of solidarity when problems are to be faced a solidarity also to archaeologists who care and work hard for an unbiased and more knowledgeable society. That being said, I have learned much from the book that is introduced now. I learned how easy it is to read and understand about social roles of women and men and their constantly changing, sometimes fluid cultural constructions, social roles of in, in, in human prehistory and early history. Keeping in mind for a lifetime that the dif what the difference uh, between sex and gender is, let alone that, 
uh, but I have especially had fun on uh, reading about mother goddesses, for instance, as I have been engaged uh, so intensively with Neolithic figurines and struggled with all that is mentioned in that, in that chapter for a long time. The illustrations we have just uh, got acquainted with Nicola uh, are to my mind also to be highlighted because I think they are funny, eloquent, both simple and compound, but always serving the text of the individual chapters. So I congratulate the editors, all the authors, and all the fortunate present and future readers of this book. Last, I would like to express my thanks and uh, to uh, not just the, the gra graphic artist of the book, but also to Karsten Benting with Sidestone Press. I am pleased that our age community came up with such a jolly and meanwhile important publication for which EAA happily sponsored, because I think this story really reflects what EAA stands for. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Esther Banfi, for your words. And now we move on to Karsten Fentik, founder of the Sidestone Press, if you please. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, yes, it was indeed a very uh, uh, special project to work on, on our end as well. And uh, we immediately saw that this was, uh, was something we, we fully supported. And uh, um, I mean, we are archaeologists ourselves, so many of these things are things we have experienced both academically and uh, like how to interpret the, the data, but also uh, the people that work for us have experienced things in, in, in the field and how people react to each other and uh, deal with each other. So we were like, yeah, this is something we, we fully support and we want to make possible. And uh, when the editors first approached us, they wanted to make a booklet and maybe have a, an online version and then maybe print like two or 300 copies. And uh, in the end, uh, uh, we managed to print, I think, 4,000 copies. And uh, um, uh, we did a sort of non-profit. So uh, all the money that was raised was completely spent on making the illustrations, paying the, uh, the designer to, uh, to come up with the, uh, the crazy idea of using the, the, <laughs> the fluorescent ink and, um, and print as many copies as we could. And uh, we subsequently uh, gave most of these away for free. And uh, so every parcel that we send out, uh, we have included uh, a copy of the, of the booklet for free as a gift. And, uh, and we also offered uh, uh, many universities uh, the option to buy copies at cost price. Um, so for example, the Christmas gift you saw at Leiden University, they, they bought uh, copies for uh, all the students and staff and they, they apparently just uh, handed them out last week. So that was uh, excellent. And uh, of the, the 4,000 copies that were printed, um, 3,000 already have been distributed now in the last three months. So we only have 1,000 copies left. And then in, um, in addition to the almost 5,000 um, uh, downloads we have, so uh, in total, uh, we're already sort of approaching the, the 10,000 mark, which is uh, really amazing. So congratulations to the whole team for uh, this accomplishment. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Carson Wenting, for your presence and your words. And now we ask Professor Bettina Arnold from the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, to give some words from the booklet contributors. Please. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, and I just want to say that, you know, obviously all of us have lots of commitments and um, publications are very rarely as enjoyable as this one was. I mean, working, you know, kind of as a team was was actually one of the the, the aspects of it that I particularly, um, I for me anyway, was personally really rewarding. But I think, in addition to obviously just congratulating the editors for for all the really hard work that they put into this book, the speed with which it came together was really remarkable, and that needs to be mentioned because I think. It reminds me a little bit of that very early conference at Chuck Mool on gender where, you know, it was seemed as though there was a sort of synergy that was meant to be and you just get people immediately on board. You don't even have to sell it. They're already there halfway, you know, to meet you halfway. Um, and I think that the audience response and the student response as well, I had a chance to, to test drive the, the booklet in one of my classes uh, in a seminar this semester. And, um, you know, the, the audience response has obviously been correspondingly enthusiastic. So what that tells me is that 
you, this is, you've tapped into the zeitgeist in a really important way with this thing. So it's both relevant and necessary. Um, and when those two things come together, this is what you have. You end up with a really successful, uh, you know, kind of rapidly proliferating kind of project, which I suspect is going to have a lot of, we say legs, meaning that it's going to go, it'll have unintended consequences and will continue to sort of develop in ways that we can't predict um, right now. And, and for me in particular, um, you know, I think one of the areas we might think about expanding into would be specifically museum studies programs, because they're the ones that don't necessarily always have the archaeological training or background. We have a program like that at our institution. Um, and this, the way this thing is set up, what's so brilliant about it, apart from the fact that, you know, having such a short amount of text forced all the authors to be extremely pithy and efficient about how they got their point across in simple language, um, is that you can use any one of these particular chapters as a starting point for really complicated discussions. So it, it, it basically is so flexible that it can be used at any sort of, uh, in any pedagogical context, in a museum context, in an undergrad class, you don't have to use the whole thing, just a couple of selected, you know, kind of elements. And again, you know, kudos to the, to the editors for recognizing that that flexibility was going to make this thing much more adaptable and more likely to, to find a really ready audience. So um, for me, given that, you know, in the U.S. right now, obviously we have a situation which is less than ideal. There was a recent case where a student um, in, or, or rather a teacher actually in one of the schools here was suspended by the school board um, for, having, uh, for having flown um, you know, kind of a flag, basically it's a rainbow flag, you know, kind of in her classroom, suspended without pay. Um, I don't think there's any question that, you know, you can see that this is very much relevant at this point, right, in, in a lot of different uh, cultural contexts. So um, we did our part with this thing, but I have a feeling that we'll sort of be continuing to see it develop in ways that, uh, that will turn out to be very positive. And uh, as an author, I can say the experience was unique and and overall, you know, definitely one of the more positive things that happened last year, which God knows we needed something positive to come out of out of the pandemic. So as a pandemic project, you know, full full marks. So thank you. Thank you very much, Bettina Arnold, for your um, words. And now it's uh, Peter Nernard's turn, head of Microsoft Word, to speak on behalf of the Kickstarter backers, if you please. Yeah, hello everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Great. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you for inviting me to this great event. Um, my name is Peter Leonard and I head up Microsoft Word and I'm calling it from Seattle. And I guess as a non-professional, I also participate in the Kickstarter program. So when I first heard of the book, Gender Stereotypes and Archaeology, I connected it on two levels, um, one professional and the other personal. And I'll talk about the professional connection first because well, how does a book on archaeology connect with a software engineer? Um, and I can explain that. So how many times have you downloaded an application to your phone and your first reaction is, who designed this? Did they ever talk to a real person? I mean, who do they even think of? And when you're designing software, a key ingredient is intense curiosity about who you're building it for. Is it a teacher? Is it a parent, a student, a lawyer? What age, income level? How do they commute? What else do they do? How often and with who? And an important part of the process is to use data to constantly identify and question what assumptions you are creating in your user research and being conscious of any implicit bias that you're bringing to the narrative. So you don't end up building software that only appeals to people like yourself. And that's how this book connected to me firstly on a professional you know, connection, the importance of just questioning stereotypes and bias and making sure you're data informed and data driven. That's the professional side of it. On the personal side of it, I grew up in Ireland in the 1970s. Um, I love school trips to museums. I was always fascinated by dioramas of prehistoric villages in Ireland. And those dioramas formed the basis of lots of childhood role-based games my brothers and sisters played. And we never questioned the narrative on display in those dioramas because we assumed it was true. Well, it was in the museum. It must be true. And to be honest, I hadn't thought about that until I saw this book advertised. And one look at the title and the image on the cover, and I thought, yes, of course. And since receiving the book, I've noticed myself increasingly questioning other narratives that are victims of bias. For example, why so few women artists are represented in the history of art? 
or in art collections and how that is influenced by who wrote the art history books and who curated the collections. So just congratulations to Laura and team on the launch of a really fantastic book that is so accessible and provokes questions, not only about archeology, span but encourages questioning that the underlying bias in all narratives. So thank you all, much appreciated from the Kickstarter community. Thank you very much, uh, Peter Leonard. And now we uh, have the opportunity to hear some words from the project sponsors and partners, Pella uh, Truel and Troll uh, Blazers. I don't know if uh, Brenna is with us on behalf of uh, Troll Blazers. Uh, so Brenna had an emergency and okay. she sent me a message which okay. she asked me to read. Perfect. So if you please, Laura. Yeah. So she says, um, dear all, we are so excited to have been part of this wonderful project. We would be here ourselves, but interestingly enough, it's quite difficult to be a primary carer for a small person and also attend evening events. This is exactly why we are so excited about the booklet. It highlights so many of the gender-based difficulties based in interpretation of the past and in the practice of interpreting it. It's a great example of how people can come together through collaboration, crowdfunding, and building networks spent on seeing change. We are so happy that could be part of your network, and we hope that your success only strengthens networks of support for understanding the connection between gender and archaeology. Keep travel blazing. Okay, thank you, uh, Laura. I don't know uh, who we speak on behalf of uh, the project uh, Pella Truel. Uh, is it Isabelle? Oh, oh, so Berlin. we are actually three. Oh, um, okay. Berlin, Berlin. And then <laughs> Sorry. And Isabelle. And um, it's no problem at all. Um, so thank you so much, especially for the editors, uh, Laura Becerca and Uroc, for their amazing work on this important subject. Uh, we are really honored to support it as a collective and as an association. Um, we especially love the fact that Nicola's beautiful illustrations have been put uh, from the very beginning at the center of the project. Um, we are living in a society with a very strong visual culture and images are a very powerful way to communicate, to share ideas and to have an impact. Um, and we think it is something you can really feel very well when you open the booklet. Um, first, you read the table of content and you find chapters like only women cooked in past societies or only high ranking men were literate. And then you see the images and you're like, oh, yes, I see what you mean. I have seen this kind of illustrations. I've seen this kind of representations before. So we really believe this is a uh, very strong. Yes, um, a booklet about gender stereotype in archaeology was indeed very much needed because we already have plenty of articles and books in English, but we didn't have one to help us reach a larger audience. And by larger audience, I particularly think about the people or colleagues who don't know what we are doing, what is gender, what is queer archaeology. Uh, we particularly uh, appreciate uh, the 17 stereotype written by Urosh about gender archaeology is an ideology because it's indeed the kind of criticism we receive about, from our colleagues. And we don't always have the time and energy to um, make pedagogy with them. So we can just send them now. And it's a good basis to, to start a conversation. And we know uh, the time is limited. So I know and over to Isabel. Well, thank you. Um, in October, we distributed uh, the booklets as part of an awareness raising workshop on sexism, harassment and assaults organized in connection with the archaeosexism exhibition at the U University of Lyon 2 in South France. Uh, they had a lot of success among those present and we would be very happy to have a translation in French. Uh, we will continue to support the project through the French speaking archaeological community, which is only beginning to discover these themes. So thank you for your work. Thank you very much to the three of you, Belin, Laura uh, and Isabel. And now uh, so we have some minutes for questions and answers, of course. So if you please. 
any questions or even comments? Um, I, do, I do have a question. I don't know if Karsten is still with us, but um, one thing that yes, he's noticed is that it isn't possible, I guess, at this point for people to order the book directly from the for the United States. I don't know if it's a postage issue or what the problem is, but um, I mean, obviously, you know, we'll find ways to distribute them here uh, as much as we can. But uh, that was one of the things that I had told the class I would I would look into. I was surprised that they wanted hard copies. I mean, they, they all downloaded the book immediately, but then they came the next class and said, can we get the actual book, which I had passed around. And obviously the thing itself was, it was attractive to them in a way which surprised me a bit. So I don't know if they, if, I mean, I, you know, we talked a little bit about this, but I didn't actually find out why um, it wasn't possible at this point to, for people in the US to order them and have them sent directly. So maybe that's something we could look into. Um... Oh, yeah, um, no, the, 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 the main problem is the postage and uh, it would be so expensive to send it. So people can actually order it from our website if they just order it from the EU section. And uh, but then, the, it, yeah, there will be like 20 euros or 25 euros postage that's, on it. That's what I figured. Um, yeah. yeah. And uh, the, the idea was that um, probably and uh, I can check that in a, in a minute or so. It should be available on Amazon, I think. Okay, and and uh, that was my uh, my my intention. That once once it, it it takes a while for it to go through the Dutch system into the Amazon system, and then suddenly it also is also available in uh, in the US uh, with zero postage if you order it from Amazon. Okay, so that's, that's what I'll tell them. So just to wait, be patient, yeah. get a physical copy if you hang on. In the yeah. meantime, use the PDF. So. Or or if you want to uh, buy copies for the whole classroom, we can send a full box. And then the, the postage is quite limited. Yeah, that's and, what uh, I just done. So yeah, well, we, we sent it last week, so it should arrive next week, Thank I think. You. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you. Can I just make a point about this? Because I remember Bettina saying when we're having a conversation before, she said, ah, oh, everybody, every young people, they prefer PDFs. And I know that, <laughs> but it's different, you know. Uh, and I urge you to see, I mean, I've seen it, uh, I've seen the thing uh, on, on, on the PDF, and I've seen the real thing. And of course, I'll advertise the real thing, but truly, believe me, the real thing is really much better. So I urge anybody to really, if you can, uh, get your hands on, on the real thing. I, I honestly think that uh, the printed booklet, it's an experience in itself. And it, that's why it's, it's like so different. I mean, the, the images and the text and the design and the colors it's <laughs> Kaisen is showing the neon orange <laughs> uh, it's really an experience and uh, you can sense that from the uh, online version but you can actually experience it when you have it in your hand any other questions or maybe there is a, there are other contributors uh, Daniela Daniela Heller if you please you raised your hand. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Um, well, thank you for making this booklet. Um, I really love it. Um, I have a question about the illustrations. Like on several occasions, you chose to illustrate the stereotype by uh, reproducing it and also by reproducing the um, male gaze that is part of the stereotype. And um, people have pointed out that those pictures are very powerful and even more powerful that the words accompanying them. So I found it an interesting decision to reproduce those pictures on, on some occasions. So could you elaborate on that? Who's going, Who's Who's going, going to, to answer? <laughs> I, was, I wanted to suggest Bisika to, to address this. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yes, I was. Well, Initially, when we started the whole project, we had a, an idea that we will mock it. We will start with mocking all of it. But very soon we realized that this is not going to be possible. Uh, because, if, for example, what I, you know, one of the things is harassment in, in archaeology. You cannot mock that. You have to be absolutely front and center saying the things as they are. Or you want to shock people with the image. He says, like what Peter said, you look at something and it comes to you straight forward and you start to realize that what you're having in front of you is you have to pause 
you have to take a deep breath and think about it. And then that's what it was deliberately, uh, uh, we were looking for that effect. And obviously the, the cover, for example, is a, is a fictional thing, or maybe it isn't a fictional thing, nobody knows. But that again, it was a very deliberate thing that you will look at it and you will not turn the page. You will stay on that image because that image will cause a reaction to you, a reaction that you may not like in the beginning. A reaction in my say, how dare they? And but then you read it, the, the text, and that eventually gets you to the point we wanted. You we wanted to alert people, to make them think, not just uh, you know, just one of those things that you pass in the museum because it's something that you've seen with the chickens, with the, uh, and, uh, nothing that engages you because you expect to see it. It's something that should, uh, but because it says gender stereotype and you would, you would expect them therefore to be something different, not to reproduce the stereotypes. When that is reproduced, it is a, it is a kind of a, again, we didn't want to be essentialist because we can't be sure that in certain societies, patriarchal systems are not in place. That will be a wrong thing to say. They may be in place. So again, it is more contested past. You have to think about the past. You don't need to say, oh, that it is. We are giving you the ultimate picture and the ultimate text about it. So it is supposed to make you think. It is not supposed to give you the ultimate essentialist uh, uh, idea of what happened in the past. So yes, we know that and we looked for that effect. We, by all means, we don't want to reproduce these uh, stereotypes. We want people to think with these images. I don't know whether that answered your question, but that's, that was our intention. Yes, thank you. Any other questions? Nobody raised. We are hand. on time. Yes, <laughs> exactly. So um, Uros, Laura, Biserka, uh, want do you want to say some final words? If so, please. The floor is yours again. Well, uh, as though, I mean, I all I want to say is thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, uh, Zealand Times. Thank you to everybody who was part of this project. Without any of you, that will not have been possible. Uh, it was a pleasure to work, and not all the time. I have to admit that there were very difficult times, that, uh, so my hair was going like that. So I, it will be lie if I say it was entirely pleasure, but we got there in the end, and uh, the authors were very cooperative. It was a difficult time, and um, but as as Bettina said, the the, the authors we we met them uh, halfway uh, uh, in the line along the path. We 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 didn't need to drag anybody into that. So. I suppose, uh, I really hope that you can see that through the pages. That was really uh, a book that we love to do. Despite the, the, some un, un, uncomfortable truths that are there, we were, we were enjoying very much. And I'm really, really grateful to everyone. So um, it was a great pleasure uh, to moderate a fantastic session. Uh, on a very, very successful project. And I thank uh, uh, the editors for the invitation. I congratulate all those who are directly and are directly involved in the booklet. I want to wish that many other projects may be carried out. Uh, I want to thank the presence of all who join us today. And last but not the least, I wish you a peaceful Christmas and a 2022 with health and a lot of archaeology, namely of gender. So see you next year. Bye-bye. <laughs>